this is the last one, so welcome to our sheep genomics cave down here. Um, so I'm Shannon Clark from Ag Research. Um, we've got Suzanne Rowe from Ag Research and also Michael Lee from the University of Otago that'll be talking to you today. We're just going to give a quick presentation um, on the Sheep Genomics Project with the aim of um, basically trying to have a discussion at the end to find out your points um, or any issues or anything we can help you with um, relating to genomics. So the research goal of the program is to deliver greater genomic discovery of BLG identified traits of economic importance. We want to do this by actually trying to find the cause of mutations, the genes or the genetic pathways that are actually controlling or, um, and giving us a better understanding of these traits. And within doing this, we hope to have more accurate GBVs and also a better persistence of accuracy across the generations. So just a quick look inside a genotyping lab. Um, so what we do is we get your TSU, so your ear um, punch tissue, we extract the DNA. We have a strand of DNA here. And when we're going to actually develop a new SNP chip, we do lots and lots of sequencing, whole genome sequencing of this. And basically the way this is done, we'll take our genomic DNA and we'll share this into certain size bases, two to three hundred base pair fragments each. This is, gets packaged up in what we actually call a library. With these libraries, they go into a sequencing machine and we sequence 100 bases of the DNA millions and millions of times, all at once. Then we compare these DNA strands of each between two different animals and look for the variation. And this is the SNP that we're actually looking for. And we'll get lots and lots of these and it's our job to actually decide on what is the subset of these SNPs. So in a, in a genome we have three three um, billion of these and we on the sheet 5k there's only 5,000 of these. So it's our job to decide which of these subset of SNPs are going to go on there because it's this SNP chip that you're using for your genomic selection. When we're doing a whole, um, looking for causative mutations what we're actually doing is a whole lot of whole genome sequencing to a greater depth so lots more so we can actually hone in and find those causative mutations and again put them on the SNP chip. So the overview of the project is going to focus on the maternal and on-farm traits. We're going to work closely with the genetic evaluation project whereby all the genomic data that we're actually generating from this project contributes to the genomic selection pipeline we're using a combination of low and high density SNP chips and ultimately we want to be able to predict using the whole genome sequence for genomic selection. We're going to continue to investigate technologies that to continue to drive genotype and efficiency so that one day hopefully that we'll have genomic selection at a similar cost to like current parent parentage prices now. So just how it all fits into the, um, into the project, so we're doing low density genotyping, um, we're using a combination of high density genotyping and also doing whole genome sequencing of key animals. We're using this to look for gene discovery and what we find from the gene discovery program we're put, putting back through into the genomic selection and this pipeline here will continue throughout the generation of the project, program. Also, we're looking to develop low density genotyping for the industry. This might be new techniques like as, um, genotyping by sequencing, um, new SNP assays or targeted resequencing. And so we're currently in the process of producing a new SNP chip where it'll be 15K, so a new low density chip with 15,000 SNPs on that. So for genomic selection, um, sort of a simple way of looking at it, it's able to, it works by able to predict um, the status of other SNP variants nearby. So you may have a SNP actually on a chip, but you can actually predict the status of the rest of the genome. And, you're allowed, and we're able to include the variants that were known to affect, affect production traits. So Suzanne's now going to talk to you um, um, about sort of where you can go with actually improving your genomic selection, and Michael's going to give you an example of that. Yep, so as Shannon says, my name's Suzanne. Um, I work at Inverme. Um, I'm an animal breeder. Um, and I'm just going to give you a bit of theory. Michael's going to give you some, some real numbers. But I'm just going to start by talking about the fact that, you know, we try to estimate from your phenotype records the, the proportion of the record that's going to be passed on to the next generation. And to do that, we really need to account for unseen potential, so climate challenges, disease. You know, and, and we need to understand whether animals are being fed to their potential or, or, or have some sort of preferential treatment within the contemporary group. So we really need to compare animals with like animals. We really need to know those mobs. Um, and this is just, just sort of saying, you know, if, if we have an accurate idea of which animals are being treated and how, then we've got a really good chance 
of extracting that portion of the record that's going to be inherited to the next generation. So that's lecture one. OK, so genomic prediction. And this is really about unraveling that, that black box that, w that we see. Each animal has, has two strands of DNA. And, and our idea is to, is to or, or our job is to come along and, and find out what that code means. Um, and this is probably just a giant barcode. It's about three billion points long, though. So what we really need to do is say, which part of that just tells us it's a sheep? Get rid of that. And then what we're left with is around 30 million differences. So that tells us that you know, your, your ram comes along with, with two strands of DNA. And at various points, there are mutations or alleles or, or gene forms. You get given all these different titles for them. And basically, all we're saying is there are differences between the animal, the DNA of one sheep and the next. And if we take one of these differences and we measure a lot of animals for this form and we measure a lot of animals for this form, then the next time an animal comes along with these two forms, this genotype, we've got a really good handle on predicting the trait at that one marker. And all we do for genomic prediction is say, OK, we're just going to add it up along the genome. And that's pretty much all we need to, to predict the trait value. Now, that all depends on how accurately we get these scores. And the accuracy of these scores is largely dependent on how many numbers we, how many animals we measure and which animals we measure. And you really need your animals in that training set for this to be relevant to you. So when you're looking at your molecular breeding value, you really want your animals in that training set. So it's because this value changes. It changes amongst breed and it changes amongst populations. So that's why connectedness and training is, is, is so important. So as I say, we, we, we start with, with the basics of just adding up these as a score and coming up with a molecular breeding value. But it's obvious that some of these markers are going to be much more important than others. And there are champions. There, there, are, there are markers that really make a difference, really predict the trait. And some of these have been pulled out as single gene tests like Myomax. But others aren't necessarily explaining the whole trait. But they're explaining 10% of the variants. And we really want to know what they are. And we want them on these low density chips. So we want the 5K to have these champions. And our job is to go along each, each time we add data and scan and see if we can find these and, and put them on the chip. And the other thing we need to do is find these guys. These guys are the deleterious alleles that lurk amongst the population. It might have been a spontaneous mutation. It might have an opposite form that's really helpful for the trait. So we're, we're breeding for this. We're dragging it along. Suddenly, we get two of these together, and we get death or morbidity. So, so it's our job to go along, find these, find these, and come up with a design that tracks those 30 million differences in only a 5K product. Um, and, and luckily, the, the, the markers that are physically close tend to be inherited together. So as long as, again, you've got animals in that training set, you know, if we, get, if we have one of these markers, there's a good chance we'll be able to work out what the other three are. So moving on. This is just a little bit about accuracy. Michael's going to give you some more information, so I won't give you much. I'm just saying that accuracy is information. It's, that's all it is. It's how much information went in in the first place. So if you've got a DNA test, you've actually got a head start because you don't need any trait information. You can already have a breeding value with some element of accuracy in it. As you add parent average or SIB information, that breeding value gets more and more and more accurate. And actually, the genomics gets less and less important. So depending on the heritability of the trait or how much other information you have is what sort of head start this, this genomics will actually give you in your sort of strive towards genetic gain. And this is just a schematic just to look at genetic gain and, and what the drivers are underneath it. And if you, if you stack your, your population or, or your flock from, from worst to best, then all we really want to do is accurately predict these, these top animals, because that's how we're going to make the most genetic gain. And we want to do it as early as possible so as we can move as fast as possible. And the real drivers of genetic gain are intensity. So and that, that's down to numbers, you know, how many of these actually you need for replacements and accuracy. Have to pick these accurately to, to keep moving forward. And the genetic variance is probably something that's slightly outside of control unless we start bringing in more breeds. Um, and the generation interval is just saying how often we select these animals and how fast we're going to go. So I'm going to pass on to Michael, as I said, who's going to give you some, some real data. 
So, so this is the fifth time I've done this. So I, I may have forgotten what I meant to say. <laughs> no, I get worse as it goes. Oh, I'll not be. <laughs> so, so what what I've done here is I've just dragged out some data from 2015. So these are ram lambs that have EBVs and they were born in about 2013. So I looked at the uh, molecular breeding. No. No, sorry, they're not born into it. So the molecular breeding values that were predicted in 2013, using 2013 data, okay? So then we basically looked at the EBVs of these uh, ram lambs in 2015. So this is when they had a lot more data, okay? And we compared the two just to see, you know, do the predictions actually stack up? So this is just a bar plot of the different traits that we predict on and the correlation between those traits. So, you know, there's some traits that, ha you know, on average haven't predicted that well. Carcass weight, I think, is only about 20%. And you can roughly think of that, this, this as an accuracy. But on general, most traits sit around about 40%. So but basically we're saying that if you had predicted a um, ram lamb in 2013 using the prediction equations, chances are in, in 2015 the numbers, you know, it, there's a reasonable relationship between that molecular prediction and what you see as an EBV like, uh, in about a year and a half to la later. Okay, so here, oh, I've So here's a plot of the um, EBVs in 2015 on the x-axis and the MBVs that, that were predicted using data up to 2013. So in general, if you had taken um, e EBVs uh, and, the, and, and used use those EBVs to predict, say, the top five candidates of those 30, you would have probably come up with a, re a reasonable, reasonably similar ranking for those ram lambs. So, and 15 and 16, you know, both of them were predicted as the best with the MBVs and the EBVs. So there's a time difference of about a year, year and a half to two years between those predictions. So at, at year zero, you probably would have had an um, pure and average for for the NLB for these, these animals, but at that time you could have had an MBV that would have probably given you a much better prediction. So the, the MBV and the EBV are then combined, so when you make your selection decisions, you know, you'd normally do it on an index, but I've just demonstrated here with NLB, we combine the EBV and the MBV to make a genomic breeding value and the rankings do actually change. So we're saying that the GBV, which has mo most, you know, the highest volume of information and, and would be the most accurate, is probably the best predictor for the trait. And there will be some re-ranking. So if you had um, took, took, taken the top five ram lambs, you would have probably chosen 23, 14, 15, 5 and 16, with the GBVs, um, but a slightly different uh, uh, ram lamb selection only with the EBVs. Michael, that EBV that you've blended, is that the, the current EBV or the one back at um, 18 months ago? No, it would have been way, the current one, yeah. So, we're, so in this case, I've blended the current one, okay. yeah. So this is what you would have seen way back, so, something more like this. That's just notice on the That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and here's just a little bit of information. You know, people ask, you know, what do I need to, to improve my training accuracies and that. And really what you can do is make sure your sire DNAs are sent into beef and lamb genetics so that they can get, get uh, put, up, put on to the tr into, to the training population. You can work on the reliabilities of your EBVs for your RAMs, but you can also 
look at connectedness as well because the genomics predictions use information from other flocks as well, not only from your own flocks. So if there's a connected flock and there's relationships in other flocks, it will actually detect those and use that information to give you a better prediction.